Thanks for joining us tonight, or if you're watching this uh, not live at a later time, thanks for tuning in. I'm Kristen Russo, I'm a pediatric orthopedist, and we're here tonight to discuss some of the uh, challenges and problems that we have started to notice over the past six months in our respective offices. I'm joined by three fantastic pediatric physical therapists who I get to work with on a daily basis and troubleshoot some of these problems with. And we have a really exciting program for you coming ahead. So I'm gonna start uh, just initially talking about uh, my experiences over the past six months. We're gonna transition over to Kelly who will talk a little bit about the importance of physical activity. And then we're going to go to uh, Prachi, who will talk about what she has actually done in her own home and how you can do it in yours as well. And then finally, Kevin will round us out talking really how to get our kids more active and prevent burnout from occurring. We're happy to answer questions. We're gonna try to save a lot of them for the end um, so that we can answer them for everybody um, to listen. And if you use the Q&A function at the bottom, as opposed to the chat function, it will make us easier to track questions without having to look through the chat. We'll also try to individually answer questions if that's more appropriate um, as the uh, lecture is going on, but we'll probably try to hold most of them to the end. So like I said, um, I'm going to speak a little bit about uh, things that I have noticed over the last six months that have gone on in my office from the pediatric orthopedic perspective and really pertaining to some remote learning challenges. So these days, everyone seems to be giving webinars and Instagram lives and all of these other platforms. You probably should know exactly who you're speaking with. So I want to tell you guys a little bit about me. Um, I'm a pediatric orthopedic surgeon. I'm board certified by the American Board of Orthopedic Surgery, and I'm a fellow of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. I have a fellowship, which means specialized training in pediatric orthopedics, which is really the non-operative and operative care of children all the way from babies to the disgruntled teenagers many of you guys have at home now. I live in Brooklyn um, in Park Slope, right near the hospital where I primarily work, which is New York Presbyterian Brooklyn Methodist Hospital. And I am mother of uh, two young children here. I also uh, work at Columbia University Medical Center with some of the physical therapists that are gonna join us today. If you have no idea what a, physic, uh, what a pediatric orthopedist does, um, that's fine. I'll tell you a little bit. So I really see a breadth of problems from congenital problems to fractures and trauma, sports, their lumps and bumps. I have a special interest in bone health, particularly calcium and vitamin D metabolism. I see scoliosis, both uh, conservative care and operative care, foot deformities, overuse injuries, um, growing pains, which tend to plague us a lot, um, and gait problems. I just wanted to also introduce you guys to the Ortho Kids website, which is our patient-centered website from the Pediatric Orthopedic Society of North America. And if you have any questions, that's a great place to kind of start uh, instead of going down like a Google rabbit hole um, of things you may not uh, really need to be focusing on. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about these kind of ripples that we're seeing now from COVID. Uh, we're kind of out of that peak stage and moving now towards the other uh, side effects and how that's affecting our children. So this is kind of a less versus more battle um, that is going on here. We're seeing less injuries in the office. I know that kids are playing less sports, especially in New York City, most organized sports are canceled. Uh, kids are spending less time outside, kind of uh, you know, following those previous uh, two points above. Kids are also having less pediatrician visits. Some pediatricians still are not seeing a lot of non-essential sick visits in the office, so I'm not getting the same referrals I would from pediatricians. Also, you may not be visiting your pediatrician for these problems, or you're doing a virtual visit, and you're not getting the same experience, so you might be relying on specialist care actually more than you usually do. On the more side, we're seeing more screen time, some necessary, some unnecessary. And I'm not judging anyone here. This is a very tough time right now, but it definitely is affecting our kids. And we're seeing more sedentary lifestyles. Um, and then kind of following that, we're seeing kids at a very young age having weight gain, which is really scary. 
And kind of the, the conclusion of all of this is I'm seeing a lot of back pain in the office. So I'm gonna talk about this COVID back pain and what it is and this kind of new phenomenon that I have seen. So in the past, before March, I used to see about two to three patients per month in my office that came in complaining of back pain. And that was a lot. Now, sometimes I'm seeing two to three patients per day. And so per week that can add up sometimes to five to 10 patients, which is really just a crazy amount of kids with back pain. And so how are they presenting with symptoms? So parents are often calling the office or calling their pediatricians saying they have a hunt, their kids have a hunchback or they have a hump back and immediately they're concerned for scoliosis. So I'm gonna chat a little bit about why this is not a concern for scoliosis, but that's often the reason why so many of them I think end up in my office sooner rather than later as well. The kids are complaining of pain though when lying down, when sitting for too long, when standing up, basically it's ubiquitous no matter what they're doing. It's usually relieved supportively, heat, stretching, massage, kind of the usual tricks you would do. And importantly, there's no red flags involved. There's no nerve symptoms. There's no shooting pain up and down your leg. There's no burning or tingling. There's no real need for medication, um, which is good because I don't really need to work it up any further or be worried about anything and neither do you. They're kind of talking a little bit more about this hunchback or this postural kyphosis that is bringing a lot of patients to the office and what it really means. So I have a picture here of the normal spine and I wanna focus on the picture on the left side, which is the lateral spine. Like you're looking at the spine from the side. And you might notice that there's two very subtle curves there. So this curve up top is the cervicothoracic kyphosis that's normal and should be there. And this curve on the bottom is your thoracolumbar lordosis. So you have this convex and concave curve that really balance off of each other. And that creates your sagittal alignment. And when your sagittal alignment is not balanced, that is actually what gives you pain. So posture is really just your sagittal alignment. So when you have poor posture, you have a loss of the sagittal alignment and you get back pain. And that's really what's driving kids to come into the office. So when I get into the exam room for someone that's coming in with back pain, or sometimes quite honestly, not even coming with back pain, I'm usually met by this picture. Instead of sitting on this bench, they're sitting on my exam table and they're in this kind of C-shaped position. They're hunched forward, their head is dropped because they're usually looking at a screen and they've lost kind of any kind of that natural sagittal alignment that we want them to have. So I usually tell them they're sponsored by the letter C and instead I want them to be sponsored by the letter I. Um, Really, I mean, in orthopedics, we'd say the letter S because that's that natural curve that your spine is shaped. But if you look at the difference here between that C shape and that S shape, you're losing the lordosis in your lumbar spine where that red kind of shadow is on this picture. And because of that, you're also increasing your thoracic kyphosis, which is giving you that hunchback or that humpback phenomenon. But when you sit up straight, those two curves are kind of corrected again you can kind of see if we overlay them on this picture, what is going on with your spine there and what the problem really is. So kind of to sum up um, what I've been seeing with COVID back pain, just back pain in children is not normal at any age. And we really are looking for red flags and seeing if there's something wrong before we kind of just pass it off. Normally children attend school and they sit in desks and children are active. And as my colleagues are going to tell you later on, they're very active and you probably won't even believe the numbers of minutes they're, they're supposed to be active per day. And really this is unlike most adults. Most adults, if they're at work, don't sit properly, don't have great ergonomics. Most adults are not active. And a lot of adults have back pain. It's the number three reason in this country to visit a doctor behind other musculoskeletal pain. So somehow along these last couple of months, we accidentally turned our children into adults and the challenges that we're facing with COVID really have a lot to do with that. So we're kind of were inspired by turning back the clock if we could to you know, reverse time in our children, give them their childhood back, give them their ergonomics back and how we could do that at home. So I'm gonna leave it to Kelly next to talk a little bit about the importance of physical activity and how you can avoid becoming or maybe reverse becoming 
discussing a COVID couch potato. Okay, hello to you all. Thank you so much for being here. I feel so fortunate to be working with these fabulous colleagues to bring you this important topic tonight. I will be touching on the um, value of movement and the myriad of benefits it brings to our lives. My name is Kelly Grimes and a little bit about me. I am a physio. I come to the realm of um, pediatrics through an interest in scoliosis, initially in my adult clients. In physio, this is physical therapist. I'm a lifelong runner. This is my delirious face as I'm about to cross the finish line of the 2016 New York City Marathon. And I am a cool auntie to my niece, two nephews, a third on the way, and to the really cool kiddos of my beautiful friends. As Dr. Russo indicated, our lives were completely turned upside down earlier this year. COVID brought heartache, sadness, and in a society where we were already pretty reliant on technology, we were thrust even deeper into a reliance um, in the digital space as a lifeline. That plus shelter in place orders and our daily movement routines came to a screeching halt. And for our children, this meant the loss of recess, physical education, sports, recreational activities, and the like. And part of what we suspect, as Dr. Russo alluded to, is that this loss of movement, loss of movement variability, probably coupled with turmoil, a time of stress, uncertainty, may be contributing factors to this uptick in visits to healthcare providers that we're seeing with complaints of pain, as if our, the alarm system on our kids are going off or the nervous systems are ringing an alarm bell as if to say, hey, pay attention to us, do something, our bodies need to be attended to. And rightfully so, because movement is such a key aspect in terms of how we interact with the world. Who doesn't love being around an infant and watching them make discoveries for the first time? And it's everything, it's their eyes looking all around, touching, grabbing, kicking, and, this ground-based exploration with development becomes play, games, sport in childhood. And as the years pass, ideally becomes a consistent physical activity and exercise routine that we can sustain through adulthood. We were never meant to stare at screens all day, like I'm doing now. Movement is a vital component of overall health, technically falling within the physical realm of health, along with nutrition and sleep. But we know that there's strong interplay with the other spokes of overall health. There are numerous benefits of movement and physical activity for our children. Our bony tissues are on the upswing during childhood, and we continue to lay down bone mass until our late 20s after which we're no longer increasing bone mass. And so it's important to take advantage of these childhood years. Movement optimizes our children's metabolism. It improves cardiovascular and respiratory fitness. It works on muscle strength and certainly and absolutely affects brain health in the form of increased cognition, better focus, and in terms of our emotional health, of a reduced risk of depression in kids who have movement as a consistent part of their daily routines. The Journal of the American Medical Association published their latest physical activity guidelines in 2018. And the recommendation for children under the age of five is movement of varying levels of activity at least three hours broken up throughout the day. And this can look anything from moving about a room um, putting together Legos as a low level activity to running around outside as a more vigorous intensity activity. In school age children, the rec is at least 60 minutes per day of at least moderate to vigorous intensity activity with vigorous activity, muscular strengthening exercise and bone strengthening exercise occurring at least three days of the week. And these are just some examples of activities and their corresponding intensity delineations. An easy way to assess or gauge if your child is engaging in a certain intensity level for a given task is to administer a quick talk test. So let's say you're out hiking with your child. If your child can talk but can't quite sing, 
likely they're working at a moderate intensity for that task. Whereas if your child can say just a few words and then needs to pause to take a breath, they're likely engaging at a vigorous intensity. Some examples of exercises that produce a muscular challenge are numerous. And on the left-hand column, there are various activities that use body weight as the challenge. The middle column includes activities and games that challenge muscular strength, such as climbing. And on the right, as um, age development and appropriateness comes about, starts to introduce resistance bands and external weights. Bone strengthening examples include jumping rope, hopscotch, sports involving pivots or changes in direction, and running. And all of these fit the bill because they place a force or load into the tissue that the tissue then has to adapt and respond to. And in healthy children, the response is the laying down of further bone, which is what we're looking for. Before giving some recommendations on how to make movement a more intentional priority as we continue to navigate these times, and actually my colleague Kevin is going to give some more tangible strategies as well later on the talk. A quick bow down and huge amount of respect and thanks to all the parents, educators, grandparents, aunts, uncles, supportive adults in our kids' lives that are helping our next generation navigate these tricky times. There's a lot to juggle um, and you're doing a great job. And these are just a few suggestions. Number one, if you're able to take a bird's eye view of your family's weekly calendar and figure out times where maybe together as a family, you can engage in some physical activity. This could look like a Saturday morning hike or a Wednesday evening bike ride after dinner. Um, and that way that activity could potentially be plotted in the schedule, just like any appointment that you would schedule for yourself. Second, if there are opportunities to reach out to your child's school to figure out how they are making movement and intentional focus throughout the day, if at all, then that can be super helpful. And that way you can plot those movement breaks in schedule, just like you would plot snacks or lunchtime. And we're seeing a huge variation in what schools are doing, anywhere from some schools looking like they're administering structured movement breaks to other schools where kids aren't really reporting any formal movement breaks at all. And finally, a quick Google, Google search reveals a number of websites, YouTube channels, um, apps that provide quick snippets of movement education. Um, if you are, as a caregiver, attending to something else and you still want your child to move around um, a little bit safely. We're going to next dive into posture and ergonomics. But before we do, and Dr. Russo touched on this, we want to push back a little bit on this idea of there being one good posture or one bad posture. Um, and I think the question to ask is, is your child in a position 99% of the time that either they cannot get out of or they don't get out of? So the C-shaped posture that happens the majority of the day and you don't see your child engaging in a variety of positions or movements or they don't move out of that position. So this idea that there's not this one perfect posture, but that we encourage variability as a goal. And with that being said, there are certainly key concepts and principles to assist you in setting your child up for success as they navigate distance learning. And with that, I'm happy to turn the mic over to my colleague, my partner in crime, good friend, Prachi Bakarania. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Hi, everybody. My name is Prachi Bakarania. I'm a physical therapist and co-director of the non-operative care of spine and scoliosis at Columbia University. Um, as Kelly and Dr. Russo was mentioning, we've been seeing this very large exponential rise in kids coming to our clinics with neck pain, back pain, similar to our 30, 40, 50 year old patients. And we just were compelled to, to hopefully help and um, you know, help reduce the incidence of that happening. On a personal note, I like many of you picked up my young children from school in mid-March and then virtually overnight um, had to change our home into a virtual learning environment.
When I think of um, ABCs of ergonomics, I think of it like an acronym, A for alignment, and alignment not just for um, the child and posture, but also about the device that they're using, just making sure that it's accessible to them and um, that, that they're well supported. B for best environment, meaning the space that they're using is decluttered and quiet and just conducive to learning. And the C for comfort, this often um, is a, a bit of a disagreement between parents and kids. And often the parents will say, well, my child, you know, really loves studying on the bed or on the couch and, um, and they're likely coming in for back pain. And that's where I want to start first is the B's and C's, the best environment and the comfort. And part of that is um, couches and beds are just simply not conducive for a supportive environment. You place children on a couch and sooner or later, their bodies just morph to the form of the surface that they're on. And this goes back to the talk of the postural kyphosis that Dr. Russo mentioned with the forward head, that C-shaped posture and just adds a lot of compressive forces to a developing spine. As far as the bed goes, you place a child on a bed and bed is associated with sleep and resting. And before you know it, they've kind of assumed this laying down position, which is you know, not the best conducive environment to learn and be focused. I'm gonna switch gears here and just talk a little bit about alignment for the rest of my talk. And I like using the analogy of a Lego tower when it comes to posture, mostly because I just love playing with Legos and thinking of a Lego tower as far as, you know, head, torso and trunk goes, that's similar to when I look for and I'm kind of describing posture to a child. And for example, if, you know, two of the Legos, a picture on the right, this kind of symbolizes the forward head and this kind of makes, you know, a little bit more load to the spine. Now, how do you set up your environment given with what you have, maybe limited resources? So if, if you are um, using, for instance, a tablet of some kind, in addition to thinking of the Lego tower with the head, torso, and trunk in alignment, I like to think of this 90 degree rule, thinking of the hips and knees also at 90 degrees. So here, if you're only using a tablet, for instance, and there is no, um, uh, there's no other supportive area for it. You know, the head is definitely going to be looking down and the head is not at 90 degrees. And you can even see, you know, she's already assuming this C-shaped posture. So now I, I, you know, we put a little stand behind the tablet and it's a little bit closer to where I want it to be, right? The head is definitely more upright and her eyes are definitely closer and looking at the tablet, but it's, it's close, um, but probably could be better. Now, for instance, now say you have a lower surface, a, an actual kid's desk, if you're able to, to be able to find one, um, this is a little bit too small for her, right? So now she's looking at the device and she's looking down and her head is you know, much too low, but it's good. Her hips and knees are, are actually to the ground. So this can also go for laptops, for instance. So say if she was using a laptop, you would just put you know, something underneath it, Lego blocks, books, Tupperware, really anything. And if you end up using this with a laptop, for instance, now it'd be really uncomfortable to type in this way because now the keyboard is way too high. This is when you would use an external keyboard and there are many on the market that you can use. Um, and this way the monitor is at the level that you would like it to be. And then you have a keyboard that is accessible. Now, what if you're using a folding chair on a dining table, which is completely fine, except most children, you know, their feet don't reach the floor. And, and then as you can see right away, you know, you start seeing that C-shaped posture because her feet are trying to reach the floor and they're just not there. So you just kind of bring something that makes the floor closer to her, like a step stool. And here, you know, we just took one of the couch cushions so that it's a little bit closer. So before I end my talk, um, just thinking about alignment, thinking of, you know, the head over the torso, over the pelvis, 
thinking of the 90 degree rule with hips and knees at 90 degrees, finding an area that's decluttered, quiet and conducive for learning and something that's comfortable and supportive for them. But what do I do about my child who is very fidgety? Well, fear not, Kevin, my colleague and friend is an expert and I'm going to, um, I can't wait to hear his talk. All right, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Breakout to vent and burnout. First, a little bit about me. I got my bachelor's in kinesiology at Penn State University, followed after a short six weeks. I started my program at Long Island University for my doctor of physical therapy. With my physical therapy career, I started at NYU's Hospital for Joint Disease and worked predominantly with chronic spinal pain. Uh, then, and my current position after that was here at New York Presbyterian Book of Methodist Hospital, where I work with predominantly pediatrics. Uh, in my first few years here, I had a lot of scoliosis patients, was not really sure the best way to treat them, and I became fully certified in the Schroff method for the treatment of scoliosis. So, breakout to Brent burnout. The human body is not designed to spend extended periods of time in one stationary position. Despite the best ergonomics and optimal posture, the body needs breaks. The study below was conducted with college students in a 2.5 hour college lecture. And after that 2.5 college hour lecture, each student um, said that they had increased levels of pain as well as increased levels of sleepiness. How can we fix that? Micro breaks. If you're already squirming or fidgeting due to discomfort, you waited for too long. Move your body before your body's telling you to. I can attest this because in PT school, one of our professors set a timer for every 30 minutes to get up and move for just two minutes and that two minutes really woke the class up. Also nowadays, a lot of people have different types of smart watches. My smart watch tells me to get up every hour. Lastly, I learned this one while I was working with chronic spinal pain patients. Drinking lots of water causes you to get up and move to use the restroom during the day. So this one is really great for patients or for adults who are have a long work day. The importance of a routine. As adults, an unexpected change in the morning can throw off the entire day. Although most children won't get the feeling of an impending doom if they don't have their morning coffee, they'll still benefit from routine. It can help build confidence. It teaches the term looking forward to or first now and then offers stability, helps build cooperation, but most importantly, can create a routine in childhood that can establish healthy and constructive lifelong habits. Most importantly though, they're still kids, so be flexible with your routine. As Kelly was talking about, the CDC and American Heart Association recommend 60 minutes or more of physical activity per day. This can feel like a daunting task for an adult, but how about a full family with multiple children? So let's talk about what physical activity actually is. You can think about physical activity uh, as the typical running, planks, crunches, and push-ups. However, if you can't build that into your routine with your children, classes are fine as long as it's safe with COVID, gymnastics, karate, and dance, playground activities, as Kelly touched on, jungle gym, hopscotch, jump rope, and tag. Although at these times, we don't really wanna increase the video uh, or screen time, active video games are a way to get children to move nowadays. Lastly, running errands or doing chores around the house. This kind of leads into our micro breaks and in the future, the fidgety child. Getting the child to move throughout the day, whether it just be for a small task, is considered physical activity. So the fidgety child. Despite having the best ergonomics and building physical activity into the daily routine, some children, whether it be an attention disorder, sensory processing difficulty, or just an active child just can't sit still. How I explain this in clinic is sometimes kids just need to burn off a little extra energy or have a little bit more sensory input to assist in the focus on the task at hand. In the next few slides, I'll talk about a few potential self-regulating tools to assist with this population. So alternate seating. Um, <clears throat> chairs can allow for a little extra movement that can get rid of that little bit of energy to burn off to allow them to focus more. Sometimes chairs can just be uncomfortable and kids don't wanna sit still. Or other time, chairs can be too comfortable and kids want to slouch on them and just fall asleep. So just adding a cushion can help an un uncomfortable chair. Having a ball without back support can allow the child to not slouch and not have that sleepy feeling. 
or the two discs on the right will allow that child to get a little bit of ener extra energy out by shifting and weight shifting their pelvis. Standing desks. Standing desks can increase how alert and how focused a child is due to nowhere to slouch and just standing can be comfortable. It allows a child to also shift weight. As you can see in the one picture, it can allow a child to stand up. And sometimes, which you'll see in the next slide, I'll have an elastic band that allow a child to kind of bounce up and down. If you can't afford or don't have the space for a standing desk, you can just do work at the kitchen counter. Or on the other side of my screen, you can get extendable uh, legs that you can add to any wood or any surface. Other options. Most people have heard of fidget toys since the fidget spinner became popular a few years ago. What you see on the screen are different types of self-regulating tools. On the left side is what I was talking about with the elastic bands. It can allow a place for kids just to have some jumping feet or give a little pressure forward or backwards. We have a weighted stuffed animal and all these different fidgeting toys uh, or tools that the kid can use in one hand while they're typing or in the other hand while they're writing. The key thing here is that these are supposed to be tools and not toys. That's why you specifically don't see the fidget spinner. The fidget spinner over the years has become a toy and not a tool. So if this is you find helps your child and when they do eventually return back to school, just be mindful this can also be a distraction to other children. So bigger options. If, if needed, these bigger options are available. Prior to class for an overactive child or that fidgety child, a trampoline or just running up and down the stairs inside the house is a great way to burn off some energy. Uh, if you have the ability to, during class, there are bicycle chairs, there are treadmill chairs, uh, treadmill desks. Um, and lastly, some kids just need a little extra pressure input to calm the body. Um, you can have a weighted blanket, a weighted vest or a compression vest or a beanbag chair, which all might help with this need for um, a calming sensation. And now I'll let it go back to our moderator, Dr. Russo, to uh, follow up with some questions. Okay, so um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And I hope you guys got a taste for a little bit of what we've been encountering and how we've been trying to care for your children um, to the best of our ability. Uh, we have um, a few questions and we thought we would also have a couple um, of questions that we thought of that maybe you guys might not think of um, as well. So one of the, the questions that you know I always get or you know, parents always seem to be concerned about or maybe when you're going to the physical therapist is when you need to take that next step, when you need to seek medical care, when is there pain that you should be worried about? Um, and I talked a little bit about none of the pain I'm seeing being really red flag pain, which is good. But pain that is worrisome to me, back pain in a child, um, all of it could, I mean, we don't want to have it, but pain that usually signifies more than this kind of postural pain that you're getting um, from poor ergonomics is um, pain that is really localized. When kids can take one finger and point to one place on their back consistently every single day and say that that is where the pain is, that's worrisome to me. This type of back pain, kids are usually pointing like, to their lower back and to their neck and you know, it, it comes and goes and it, it, it moves around. But anything that can be localized with one finger repeatedly every day worries me. Um, pain that responds super well to anti-inflammatory medication like Advil or Motrin um, also worries me and can be the sign of something more serious. So if you're having pain and then all of a sudden um, the pain is relieved um, by that, you should probably seek uh, medical care for that. Um, as I kind of mentioned, any pain that runs down the leg, shooting pains or numbness or tingling in the toes and also in the upper extremities and the hands um, running down the arm Arms, that could be a sign that the nerves on the outside of the spine are affected. And so you want to uh, seek medical care right away for something like that. And of course, anything that is um, bladder or bowel related can also be pointing towards um, a spinal problem. So you would also want to seek care um, right away for that. Um, I see there's a, a question coming in. Um, I don't know if, uh, if Prachi, if this is something that you would want to um, address if you want to um, just read it to all of the participants and then kind of register it because I think that you talked a little bit about this and also have aged children um, around this, uh, this age that we're referring to. Sure. 
Um, so the question reads, uh, do you re re recommend sending a step stool to school with, with your child because if their feet don't touch the floor, um, if the kindergarten tables are too high, or is this only a thing to do at home since school is a different world? Um, I, I guess it depends on the environment. If, if at school, if um, you know, you're, you're seeing your child not have the best posture um, for, for the schools that my children have been in, rarely are these young kids staying in one spot for too long. Maybe they're doing an activity for 10 minutes and then they're going somewhere else, sitting on the floor doing something else. Um, at home, what I'm seeing more is, you know, from nine until two, they are literally sitting in one spot with a little bit of rest break, which is very different from the traditional school environment where they're moving to different parts of the room, they're going out for recess, they're going to a different classroom. Um, but yes, you can always ask the teacher about bringing in extra props if you need to. So Kevin, if you want to tell us maybe a little bit about where you can purchase some of these products that you have mentioned, the fidget tools and some of the other kind of gadgets, that would be great. So most of the things that I had on my slides were actually taken from Amazon. Um, they're also any of the, the big box stores will have most of those fidget devices. Um, the one that I get the most questions about was the disc that you put on the seat, which is called a balance disc. Uh, simply put that into your search and you'll have over 50 hits for different types of balance discs. The fidget toys, you can just type in sensory toys or um, fidget toys and you'll have a whole list of different types that come up. Some come in a big uh, box with multiple kinds so you can try out uh, what your child likes best. So um, we have a question coming in um, about how to get your kids to stay active during the winter months as the weather gets colder. Um, so some kids, of course, like to play tag, jump, running outdoors and are very active and we're really limited um, uh, indoors during this time. Um, so this is a really great question. Um, I have a four-year-old and a two-year-old and um, I'm really fearing um, the winter with you. So um, I agree. Um, I could tell you uh, personally, and I think that Kelly mentioned, you know, some of these things and um, Kevin also alluded to them as well. While we don't want to really increase that screen time, um, we may be able to, to use it to our advantage um, and some of the really, uh, the great stuff that's out there already. Um, if you have a Wii, um, you know, if you're of my generation and you might still have one, it's maybe a good idea to break that out and to use some of those games just to keep kids um, getting up and getting active. Um, my own kids really like the Cosmic Kids Yoga, which is free on YouTube. Um, and there are very various other uh, platforms like that um, where they have kind of, um, you know, kitschy kids um, themes to them, different holidays, and that really it gets them up and moving and doing different things uh, without you having to really reinvent the wheel or try to, uh, you know, to, to do all of the things yourself. And you can also do it with them, um, which is fun, and they always like that, and you really don't need any extra equipment um, or anything to do that. So I don't know if, um, if anybody else has some other ideas feel free to chime in. <laughs> okay, um, just some other questions, maybe a little bit more about um, the posture stuff and postural kyphosis and the C-shaped posture, uh, about whether or not it is uh, permanent and something that uh, we have to worry about this kind of being a lasting um, effect on our children. You were wondering uh, at the end of all of this, what the side effects are going to be and what is the, you know, the ultimate take home going to be from our children. So as long as you get the postural kyphosis under control early, it's basically reversible. reversible. It's postural for a reason. So it really is focused on how you're sitting. The problem becomes the longer and longer that you stay in this posture, the more your muscles like to be in that posture. And that's really also why you then get the back pain when they're laying down to sleep at night or they're standing up straight. They're in more pain then because their body wants to be into that C position. So you wanna try to undo do some of those habits if they started already uh, to make sure that they you know stretch out um, and don't get their muscles in that contracted position and then really if you do stay in that position for too long um, you can end up getting bony changes it takes a long time for that to occur and I don't think that any of us are in danger of that 
happening right now. Um, but you know, if you if we do do this for the next you know 15 years without breaking a habit of it, yes, it definitely will um, become a problem down the line. But for now, we should all think that it's reversible and that it's not going to have any effect on our children as long as we can um, kind of nip it in the butt. So um, I think, uh, Kevin, there's a question coming in about wobble chairs. Um, I'm not sure if you directly addressed wobble chairs, but um, do you recommend wobble chairs? And um, then maybe also um, for either Kevin or for Prachi, um, talking about a laptop stand, kind of um, raising that up to eye level if you just want to comment um, on that as well. Um, as for the wobble chairs, I don't have a lot of experience with them. Uh, I've never necessarily recommend them. I usually recommend just getting a physio ball or yoga ball. They're usually uh, the cheaper solution to it. Um, it's all the kind of the same components as the chair is going to move underneath your body. And it's going to cause you to focus on what you're doing. And that's like your little bit of fidget. So wobble chairs, I think would also be great. I've never, I don't have experience with them, but very similar to the yoga ball. Um, as for using a laptop, I do usually recommend raising a laptop up with a laptop stand. However, that does throw off your 90 degrees at your elbows. So I'll usually recommend getting a wireless keyboard or another keyboard that you can have your elbows at 90 and still have the screen up high. Yeah, and just to piggyback on that, this has been super helpful, not only for me, but I've recommended to some of the more like junior high, high school level kids that just have a laptop. Um, this is my laptop stand that I have here in my apartment. It can, it's portable, so I can take it to work if I need to. And then it opens up, if I can do it, it opens up and I can just sit my laptop on this portable stand. Um, with a detachable, like Kevin said, keyboard and mouse, and then you simulate it like a desktop computer. Um, and the same um, participant also has a suggestion for a great game on uh, Nintendo Switch um, that uh, that they use to get movement going. Um, and she also does dance parties with her kids and also wants to recommend that Kids Bops um, has some great videos that your kids might be interested in. So it's always nice to have uh, suggestions from parents that are going through it. So thank you so much for that. Um, Hey, I'll talk a little bit um, also about advocating for our children for breaks um, during remote learning. I know from um, you know my own family and people that are having difficulties with this, it has been inconsistent um, across the board between teachers giving appropriate breaks, especially based on age level and kind of really how you know you can advocate um, and and handle this. Um, I think the the best way really is uh, to talk to the teacher, of course, first. Um, and if they really do not seem responsive to it, um, you, you should escalate this, uh, I think, sooner rather than later, because remote learning is not going away. Um, and we want to break the bad habits that everyone may not really understand um, right from the start and, um, and you know, kind of escalate it up the chain. Uh, there, there, is, there are some great resources within most public school systems and definitely within private school systems for physical therapists and occupational therapists. And you may want to ask to, um, talk with one of them or meet with one of them, you know, just have a phone call with one of them because maybe they can provide some more education as to why this is important, you know, like we're doing here tonight. Um, and, you know, we're, we wish that everyone was, uh, was listening to this and was understanding what was going on, but we know the reality of it um, is that it's not really happening. Um, I don't know if anyone else has anything to kind of add about how to advocate for your kids. Yeah, I, I uh, last week wrote a letter, you know, really just like, hey, I know that you're juggling a lot, teacher, with some of your students being in person and then the other half of the class being remote. Um, but if, if there's any way that you can plug in, and this, this was a, an older kid in high school, so any way you can plug in in the beginning and maybe at the end of class, just a real quick stretch, stretch break, um, because this particular student was going from you know, one class to the next without a break and his particular lunch was at like nine o'clock in the morning. So then from 9.50 to 2.50, five hours straight with, with nothing in between. Um, and so, you know, uh, his mom also reached out to the guidance counselor, which, um, which I think was helpful. Um, 
in, in our in our school district, um, you know, they were going between having longer breaks and shorter breaks. And at least for the younger kids, it worked really well just to have, you know, a five minute break and the teacher very clearly saying, you know, please turn off your screens, please go run around your house please and then or, or like bring bring me something where they have to run up two flights of stairs to get something um which which has helped okay so we have another um question about uh, the use of laptops or um, just screens in general and um, it's what is the proper distance uh, between children's eyes and uh, laptop screens anybody want to feel that one I can. I believe it's if um, if your child is looking straight ahead, the eyes should look at the top of the monitor, and that way, at the bulk of the monitor, the eyes are gazing down, just like about you know 20 degrees, um, which is all good in theory. I can certainly point to times in my life where I go right into that C, but as a general rule of thumb. As far as distance too, I usually recommend if you put your hands out and do a fist like straight like this, that should be pretty close to where the screen's distance should be from your eyes. Um, it's what I've given in the past for adults and I think it would hold true for the pediatrics population as well. Okay, um, question about whether or not you can use some of the funds that you may have stored up like HSA funds or FSA funds for ergonomic home setup, which is um, an interesting question because you probably have funds this year that we're not using. Um, so this question is kind of up in the air. Uh, some will allow it, some won't allow it. You would definitely need a letter of medical necessity from your doctor in order for that to have the potential of happening. But I've had some people say it works and some people say that it didn't work for them, but it's best just to give it a shot and ask your doctor for a letter. Okay, um, anybody have any advice about how to buy a chair for a child um, in terms of like size and you know just where to go or how much is too much because we're seeing all these advertisements and suggestions and probably people are trying to take advantage of a lot of parents right now in this situation. Um, for me, I think simpler is better. I don't think it has to be a fancy chair. I think you can use what you have because you have to remember the kids are going to grow and they're just like a pair of shoes. If you get a chair that's specifically sized for them, it's going to last maybe a year, maybe less. So even just taking whatever existing chair you have, using cushions, pillows, step stools, anything just to kind of help make it more comfortable is sometimes even a better fit than, and then even right now actually going into the store and trying on chairs is, you know, sometimes not even feasible. So you're just getting something off, you know, online without having your child sit on it. Um, yeah, that's what I'd recommend. We should have remembered we were doing this on Amazon Prime Day to see if there was anything good we could recommend to folks. Um, but I guess if you're not watching this live, it won't be Prime Day anymore anyway. Um, but yeah, I think tend to jump in on this also is, um, you know, we're, we're all struggling with how to make our homes more ergonomic, but really we should probably be making our homes more like school and school desks are bare bones. I mean, you know, they're not like these fancy office chairs that we have as adults. Uh, they're chairs that basically do exactly what we've been saying though, sit you up at that 90 and 90 um, that, you know, may not position you may not want to be in, but it is a position you should be in and that it forces you um, to kind of sit in. So you may not remember what it was like um, to be in that position or you know, to be in those desks because that's it's really very simple and very minimal, I think what we need. And maybe when we go, you know, too far with all of this is where we get into more trouble and kids get um, kind of more comfortable with it. Um, I think more most important thing is getting them off of their beds, getting them off of their couches. Um, and if you have to use the dining room table, like Prachi showed you, that's totally fine. Make some adjustments. If you have a desk or you're in a position to get a desk, you know, look for simple um, and, and don't let anybody kind of take advantage of you in the situation, you know, trying to advertise that you need to do something more 
for your kids' ergonomics because really they just need what they were getting before um, in school. So if you can recreate that environment, um, that would probably be great. I think maybe we'll um, do one more question um, and then maybe just show you guys our contact info again. Um, so in case anybody needs to get in touch with any of us. Um, so a lot of um, folks also get referrals to see occupational therapists and none of us are you know, occupational therapists, um, but uh, what is an occupational therapist's role kind of in this situation? And what do you, um, as phys pediatric physical therapist, you know, what do you think that uh, you, you may also need to see them for or, or not um, if people are referred to occupational therapists in school and whatnot? Um, I think occupational therapists, you know, they, they help treat any upper extremity disorders. They're also really good with sensory disorders and, um, you know, helping kids with fine motor tasks. Um, so at any time when it's, you know, more fine motor related, um, sometimes more sensory related, I'm, I'm referring to my occupational therapy um, colleagues. Yeah, I agree. In, in the pediatrics world, there's a lot of overlap between OT and PT. Um, in school, I would say that OTs usually have a better understanding of ergonomics as well as the sensory side of it. Um, but in the pediatrics world, both of us collaborate a lot and we really bounce ideas off of each other pretty often. So either a PT or an OT would be a great spot to go to for ergonomics. Okay, so we're just gonna share um, our contact info again. Um, most of um, us is pretty easy probably to make an appointment with us, whether you want that to be virtual um, or you want that to be in person. Um, I am not positive, I will defer to my colleagues because they're all doctors of physical therapy. I'm pretty sure that anybody can see you guys without seeing me first too, is that correct? Um, and so that, um, you know, if for some reason you can't get in to see your local pediatric orthopedist, um, most of the time you can see a doctor of physical therapy if, um, if you want to have some of these um, issues checked out as well. So thanks again, everyone, um, for coming. Um, we're happy to field things via email as much as we can. Um, those are all our office numbers to get um, appointments with us. And um, some of us have a social media presence that we would um, love for you to, to follow and see some of the uh, things that we post about work um, and about kind of our work-life integration as well. Um, if there's uh, no more questions, I'll turn it back over to uh, Columbia um, for any final parting words and uh, just thank you guys for coming. I hope that you learned something. I feel like I definitely learned something and uh, hopefully we'll be able to do some more of these events uh, soon. Thanks for joining everybody. Just um, a reminder that we'll have a recording of this posted up online um, at the same place where you registered for the event um, and you'll all get an email with a link to the final recording um, sometime in the next couple of days. Thank you very much for joining. Have a good night.